What's up? All right, we are live, and it's a, another edition. It's Friday night, and the bar is open, and we should be talking about skepticism and science and all kinds of stuff like that. And as you can see, my faithful viewers, we have a guest tonight. Um, we have Jupiter J.D. Sword. And I'm going to read off my cheat sheet here of his bio because I can't remember everything, especially when I'm drinking. So <laughs> Jupiter J.D. Sword is a skeptic and science enthusiast who hosts the podcast The Devil in the Details and contributed an article on skepticism to the book The Devil's Do Essays of the Elite. He has, a, he has been a member of the Center for Inquiry as well as the, as the Church of Satan since 2018. So we're going to talk all kinds of stuff tonight. We're going to talk about skepticism, science, and we're going to talk about Satanism, which is going to be fun for me because I love to talk about different things that I really don't know about. Um, and I don't have too much knowledge, although I do have my copy of the Satanic Bible that I read very uh, years ago. Years ago, I, I read this. But uh, so I might not remember everything, but I do remember that I really liked it. So. Welcome to the show. What's up, JD? Not much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I do like that shirt you have on. Um, that's pretty snazzy. Very, very fancy. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very awesome <laughs> dude. Uh, very... may have designed it. Mm. Do you have a drink tonight? I do. Um, not your father's root beer float. Oh, I like bar. that. Wow, so we got a bunch of people in here. We're already up to 13, which is nice. I like double digits. It's always good. What's up, Jason, Karen, Kathy, uh, Tom, Greg? What's up, guys? All right, so I'm just going to jump into this. Uh, basically, we the same rules apply as they do every week. Um, this is the Skeptical Help Bar. We're going to talk about skepticism in some form. Uh, so we're going to take your paranormal related questions. We're going to take your, your questions about Satanism, science, skepticism. Uh, both of us are going to do it tonight. So we have two bartenders, which is awesome. Uh, rule number two is basically we don't know everything. So there might be questions that you ask of, of either myself or JD, and we might not know the answer. So please don't expect us to. Uh, and if we don't, we do have the ability to look it up, so we might learn something new tonight, all of us, which is great. Rule number three is basically this is for open discussion, uh, friendly, polite discussion. We can have debates as long as they're respectful. That's it. Basically, don't be a dick. That's the number one rule. So with that, I'm going to jump into some questions that I have before we start looking at questions that might pop up in the chat room, which we can see, which is awesome. So... First of all, the, the first one I really, really want to ask you is that I noticed in some places when I started researching your background, not that I'm a stalker, but, you know, sometimes I am. When I started researching, I, I found that you were referred to as Citizen Sword a couple times. What's the citizen? Is that a title or what, what's that about? It's not a, it's not a title per se, but when you receive your membership card from the church of Satan as an active member. It refers to you as a citizen of the infernal empire. So yeah. it was a way for me to not necessarily use like my full name, my legal name and still be able to kind of put my name on something. So people who knew would know, you know, who, you know, who was responsible for it. Okay. Well, that's pretty cool. I, I I never saw that before. I think I have seen it when I've researched. Uh, uh, what did I do? There was a, uh, a a YouTube channel that was promoting themselves like a ghost hunting show, and they mm. I I was looking into them because they had started using like different advertisements. They were stealing advertisements from like Disney and other places and putting their own uh, text on it and, and re yeah. rehashing it. And they okay. actually used one from a, a member of the church of Satan. And I had Ooh. tracked it down. I tracked down the guy that owned it. And I remember his, he was referred to as citizen and I forget his last name, but, um, it was interesting. I thought it was interesting. So I want to, to talk about that, but I had, I had seen some, um, 
someone else. I think they were interviewed on a YouTube show and they referred to themselves as that. So okay. I was like, oh, I, you know, I never thought of that because some people who, who have titles, you know, they can use that. I don't have one. But I saw that and I was like, well, that's a nice way to kind of sort of remain anonymous. Um, I don't unfortunately, I don't remember who they were. But, okay. uh, yeah, I got the idea from um, from seeing somebody else do it. So you host a podcast. Uh, it's called The Devil in the Details. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what's it about? How did it come about? Um, just go ahead. Jump right in. So the idea was to talk about issues pertaining to skepticism and talk about skepticism in general, but from more of a satanic perspective. When I originally conceived of the, the idea for the, the podcast, part of it was because in skeptical circles, there is a certain group that gets a lot of attention because they they tend to go looking for it and they tend to, you know, kind of wave their arms around and say, hey, look, look at what we're doing. And I wanted to see more representation from the, the Church of Satan. So I figured I'm a member of the Center for Inquiry. I consider myself a skeptic. I'm also a member of the Church of Satan. If, you know, if nobody else is, is kind of stepping up. I, I guess maybe I could take a shot at it. Um, for, for me personally, my interest has always been in the devil as a, as a symbol for like the enlightenment. So the idea of Lucifer as the light bringer, as the romantic character that inspired figures in the enlightenment and people like Byron and Shelley. So taking that kind of interest in the dark side and applying it to skepticism and investigating claims of the paranormal. So for example, like the first couple episodes that I put out specifically focus on uh, a case of mass hysteria called the satanic panic. Cause I right. figured that was something that would most easily interest both skeptics and Satanists alike. And that's a popular uh, uh, time. Um, the satanic panic is something that I, I'm sure everybody watching has heard of, but probably don't know too much about. Right. And I mean, I mean honestly, it, it, it was kind of before my time. I was born in the late 80s and it kind of ran its course through the 80s and, and the early 90s. Um, and there's a lot of information out there that's that's really easily accessible. But I wanted kind of more of a deep dive. So my idea was I'm going to put these episodes out and I'm going to really try to cram as much information as I can about like each particular case or each particular person that was involved or profited off of the, the conspiracy theory. Hmm. Cool. Um, yeah. You have three episodes out right now, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. So you have uh, the first one is satanic panic. The second one is the Satan seller. Um, who is the Satan seller? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So th that was uh, a book that was published in 1972 by at the time America's number one Christian comedian, Mike Warnke. And it's supposedly a account of his time spent as a satanic high priest. And okay. it goes into detail about all the things that he supposedly did um, as a satanic high priest. And then finally, how he kind of supposedly left Satanism and was saved and converted to Christianity. Hmm. And in the third episode, uh, which I just finished today, I really liked it. Uh, it's called Michelle Remembers. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing I think that's based on a book, right? Yes, book of the um, the same name. Um, it was released in 1980 by the author Michelle Smith and her psychiatrist slash husband, Dr. Lawrence Pazder, and is purportedly an account of uh, recovered memories that she 
recovered for lack of <laughs> yeah yeah recovered memories during um therapy sessions with okay. Dr. Pazder. And I found it interesting because you did, and, and we talked a little bit about this before the show started, but it was when I write the articles for Skeptical Inquirer or for, for any, any outlet that I write for, I like to go into like the nitty gritty, the, the little details and explore every single detail and match them up with any references, you know, verify all of them. And when I'm listening to to this episode, episode three, I was like, wow, you're you're going like you're getting right into the shit there. You're getting right into it. You know, um, every little claim that came up, you were checking to see if it was true or not. And I love that amount of detail. I love how 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 much research you put into that episode. And thank you. I, I, I was, I, you know what, when you started talking about Michelle and then her, ther the, the therapist and like, I kind of got the idea, even though I didn't know the story behind it, I kind of had that idea. I'm like, I wonder if they're going to get together. And then <laughs> you were like, yep, they got divorced and then they married each other. And I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> That's a big no, no, big no, no. So, oh, spoil alert. I didn't want to spoil it for anyone. Um, but I definitely recommend anyone out there listening, go check, go check it out. Um, it's called the devil. It, when it, the devil is in the details. Um, and it's a good show. Good show. Um, what else do I have? I have, let's see, you contributed an article on skepticism to a book called the devil's do essays of the elite. Can you tell us wh what is, what, what's that book and what was your contribution to it? It's a collection of essays from uh, Church of Satan members. Um, the The version that I contributed to was a it was a newer version, newer expanded version. Uh, I personally never read the the first one. Um, didn't didn't even know it existed. But they had a call for um, entries for the new version, and I decided, you know. Uh, I haven't seen anybody really talk about the relationship between Satanism and skepticism. So I'll take a crack at it. Okay. Um, I, I don't think the book, I don't think it's currently out. You can order it, but I, it's one of those, it, it's a, it's a smaller publishing house. So I think they kind of print to fill and with everything that's going on currently. Um, I have no idea, you know, if you order it when you might get it. Okay. So what was your part in it? Like, what was, what was your article? What did you cover? Um, and un it, unfortunately I'm not prepared at all. I, don't actually <laughs> I put you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but basically it was me talking about how the, cause the idea behind the book is, each person writing an article talking about how they apply Satanism in their life. So okay. for me, I was talking about how my kind of recognition of myself as a Satanist coincided with my identifying as a skeptic in that when I was younger, I was really interested in the occult and the paranormal. And when I went to, uh, to college, I had a certain idea in my mind about I was going to go for psychology and I was going to become a, a therapist and I was going to apply Jungian psychoanalysis with, you know, uh, uh, using the occult and, and, and tarot and things like that. And when I got out of college, I pretty much, you know, they pretty much kind of told you this stuff's all bullshit you know <laughs> this isn't really what mainstream psychology is about it's not scientific you know if you want to do that that's fine but you got to go to a special school for it so i i ended up really having a appreciation for the scientific method and the idea of reason and applying critical thinking you know and I kind of looked back on all the stuff that I used to to be really interested in, and I kind of realized, ah, that's all bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you can't really, you can't summon demons. You can't cast magic spells to have your way. Like, it, you know, it, as far as fantasy, it's fun. 
you know, there's nothing wrong with indulging in it in that way, but you know, science is where it's at. Science <laughs> get, has, has tangible results. It speaks for itself, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I, I kind of circled back around and reread the satanic Bible, it really stood out to me how pragmatic an approach it was, especially considering the time in which it came out when there was a big new age revival and a big interest in the occult in the late sixties. And I really, you know, I really identified with that. I really identified with the idea of kind of seeing through the chicanery, you know, of the occult and the metaphysical stuff kind of being something that people would put on to take advantage of others, you know? Okay. Hmm. I hope that makes sense. Makes sense. We do have a question. Um, I don't want to pop it in here. Let's see. Where is it? Are all rituals made public or only at certain times of the year? So, so you might want to preference with your disclaimer first before you start yes. answering questions. Good, good. So I am a member of the Church of Satan, but I do not speak for the church. So anything that you're going to hear is mostly my opinion. Um, in this case, I can speak a little bit factually. So ritual is pretty much left up to the individual. Um, they, any kind of group rituals are more on a person-to-person -person basis. The, the church doesn't really have organized rituals. We don't hold get-togethers. Um, if we do, it's, it's once every many years. Um, like they did a 50th anniversary event. Um, but other than that, and ritual is not a requirement for a member. You know, if you have, you know, for instance, myself, I, you know, I don't really have any interest in performing rituals. So I don't. Okay. So is this, if for you, are, is it more of a, uh, and, and don't take this the wrong way, is it more of a, a novelty or... Is this something that you take seriously? I, I, I'm trying to understand because I guess the, the, the ritual, the ritual aspect, or I, do you mean, in I general? guess the whole thing in general, like you as, as a member of, of the church, Satan, is there, because you, you said you don't do rituals, you don't, but they're not required. Is there stuff that you have, do have to do? Are there requirements? So, To, be, to, to consider yourself a Satanist, you really just have to read the Satanic Bible okay. and identify with, with what's contained what's in there? therein. Now, if you want to be a member of the Church of Satan, there is an application process that you have to go through. You know, you have to answer, uh, you know, certain questions okay. to kind of, you know, weed out people who, for lack of better words, are, are crazy, you know, who are looking... <laughs> You know, fun or we're, we're looking kids. for uh, a shortcut to wealth, power, who don't really understand the philosophy. Um, you'd be surprised at the number of people who reach out thinking that, you know, we're going to hook them up with, the you know, the dark, you know, the Prince of Darkness sure. and they're yeah. going to get all the money and the cars and, the you know, the sex that they want. And it, it doesn't. <laughs> It, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work that way. So all the nerds uh, out there that can't get laid, <laughs> you're guess what? You're still not going to get laid. <laughs> That's not no, how it, it works. It, it's a very, it's a very buy your own bootstraps kind of, okay. kind of philosophy. And, and that's the part that really appealed to me was the idea that it was atheism, but, but with spectacle, you know, okay. even if I don't necessarily conduct rituals myself, I appreciate the fact that it does offer a system of symbolism and things like that, that people can find meaning in. Cause I think okay. that increasingly we're finding among the atheist community, surprise, I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. What? <laughs> that there's a certain kind of, of meaning that people lose out on. So you see uh, 
people inventing like holidays and things like that. Um, Carl Sagan's daughter, I think her name is Sasha. I think she's 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 a guest at the um, the PsyCon this year, um, but she recently put out a, a book. And I think there was a chapter in a book or in the book, or there was an article where she was talking about how her parents helped create like replacement holidays and things like that Hmm. for her as a secular person. So I think that there's definitely among the, the atheist and secular community, I think there's an increasing realization that, you know, the kind of myth and metaphor that you get with conventional religion is really important. And for some people, it does provide meaning that gets lost okay. in a secular society. Were you, think, were you talking about Bailey, the young lady at PsyCon? Is that who you meant? No, no, no. Um, okay. I think I know who you're talking about. She she just put out a, a book recently, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, it's Carl Sagan's daughter, but I, I honestly can't okay. remember. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. So... Let's see. We have more questions. They're starting to come in. Awesome. I love this. Let's see. Tom Nally, who is uh, our buddy Juan Tom. What does JD think about stereotypes of Satanism, sacrifices and stuff of the like? So what do you think? I, I, think I think it's silly. I mean, I guess it's good fun. Um, it's good fun for like Hollywood entertainment, you know, horror films yeah. and things like that. But I don't know. I, I, I think it's kind of silly. I'm always a little, just a little bit maybe taken aback when I, I see people that, that take it seriously and do honestly think that there's people out there like that. Yeah. Um, I think there was a lot and, and you address it, I think in, in your first episode of the podcast, I think there's a lot of um, stereotypes because when it when Satanism when the church Church of Satan really became popular when I guess, I guess when this book came out there were a lot of people that just made up their mind right away without reading mm-hmm. the book without actually engaging in, in in somebody that was a member and they just came up um, with these ideas and I think you touch on it in the podcast that all of a sudden these experts popped up. Um, right. on Satanism that weren't really experts. They just had their own ideas and they promoted them. And because they were on TV or on the radio, they got popular. And, and that's what everyone's opinion became. Is that is that in the ballpark there? Pretty much, yeah. Um, a lot of the people that that came forward as experts you know, they would either talk, they would either claim that they were ex members themselves, which, you know, was of course completely not true. And there was absolutely no evidence other than their, their word that they were, mm-hmm. or it was people who, you know, claim to have studied it from like an anthropological perspective. Um, or you would see people in the, like the psychiatric community who believed in the theory of false memories mm-hmm. and pretty much a lot of it came from the book Michelle Remembers. Once that book came out, you saw a lot of people, particularly in the um, psychiatric community, who would read it. And then when they would identify in their patients what they considered to be repressed memories, they would pretty much see it as a guidebook. And nobody really questioned the validity of, of Michelle Remembers, which is still kind of mind boggling in, in to me. The one thing that I noticed when I was writing the episodes for um, Mike Warnke's The Satan Seller and Michelle Remembers was a lot of the claims in those books were very easily debunked. And it's just that nobody ever bothered to follow up on any of the, you know, follow up on any of the claims, talk to people who, you know, knew these people, fact check it. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, that, that kind of blows my mind. I think that's, but, that's a common thing though, that that's very common throughout any kind of, especially when you're dealing with like supernatural or paranormal or occult topics, I think it's very common that people will pick up a book, they'll read it and then take it at face value. No one ever checks mm-hmm. up 
on the references or the quotations um, and, and to see if it really it really meant what they said in the book or if mm. they really took it from this this other book. Um, and that's that's part of the thing I was I was referring to in the beginning when I said how detailed and research good how detailed and very researched that that episode was because you did you looked at these claims these even little claims and you just said all right i'm going to take time and research this i'm going to see if this this claim is true i'm going to see if they really did say this or if they did say it was that all they said or was there more to it that changed the context you know and really got into detail and that's i think that's something that's a good lesson for everyone um in skepticism in general because you need to put the time in you really need to put the time in to verify what you're looking at what you're reading what you're seeing what you're hearing is in fact what really happened um and not just take it at face value so i i, I appreciate the work that you're doing i mean it's right here in the book sorry <laughs> Trying to figure out where the the webcam is. It's right here in the book. You know, it's been out since 1969. It's plain as day, black and white. Thank you, thank you. There you go. Uh, you know, we we don't sacrifice animals. We don't kill babies. You know, that kind of stuff has been around for 50 some years. All yep. you gotta do is read the book. You know, the, like the I, Church of Satan. The official website has a frequently asked questions page. That's fantastic. You know, any kind of questions that you might have is right there. You know, there's never, to my knowledge, there's never been um, a verified me ex member of the Church of Satan who has been involved in any kind of, you know, cult okay. crime or ritualistic criminal activity. So, to to bring it back around to that question, I think it's silly. Um, there is a part of me that that kind of is hopeful that the idea of being scared of Satanists has kind of went away. There seems to be a lot more, you know, the past 20 years, I think there's a lot more things for people to be scared about legitimately yeah. or otherwise. Yeah. Um, I think it, it comes down to fear of the unknown, you know, and, and I guess it's easier now. Maybe the fear has subsided a little bit because it's much easier now in this day to research something. Um, from the comfort of your own home, you don't have to actually talk to anybody, you know, right. when we go back to like the seventies or eighties, you, you couldn't do that. It was very hard right. to, to research a topic like this. Um, so there was a lot of mystery and then stereotypes were out there. They were, they were mm -hmm. growing and that was the popular, I mean, I grew up in a, a predominantly Catholic area and I was raised Catholic but I used to go up, um, I live in the Philadelphia area. So I used to go to the old, uh, Byberry hospitals, um, which was used, used to be called a uh, Philadelphia state hospital. But I remember mm -hmm. going there and you'd find like these circles that we thought were pentagrams, but I, I don't, I'm pretty sure they were just really bad artwork, <laughs> but you would find right. like an animal in it. And it wasn't like, Oh, did the animal die in there? Did it, did it crawl in there? Was it put there? No, our first mm -hmm. thought, because of the community we grew up in was right. Oh, these are devil worshipers. These are Satanists, mm -hmm. you know, and of course it's them. And now we have to be careful because they're going to find us and kill us and sacrifice us and, and all this shit. But nowadays, I mean, it's, it's easy to reach out and like, you know, get you on a show and talk to somebody that is a member of it and Hey, you know, clear it up for us. So. I, I mean, in all fairness, you know, back in the day, Church of Satan members would go on shows like Geraldo or S Sally Jesse Raphael. And, you know, they would kind of come out on stage and they would say a lot of the same things that, that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would either have, I guess, an incredulous audience that had already made up their mind. Um, yeah, you know, I beforehand. think I do remember seeing, I'm pretty sure I saw interviews with Anton LaVey and he was very theatrical. Mm -hmm. Um, he had the costume and I, and I, I it, it was like, he embraced it. He, he loved that theatrical right. part. Uh, and I, I think that kind of off put the, the audience who were probably mm -hmm. like, what the fuck am I looking at? <laughs> you know? And I mean, he was just having fun. I think, I honestly think he was ahead of his time because 
you got people doing that now, you know, crazy shit like that now. So, uh, I have another question from Kathy. Kathy asks, what gods, if any, are invoked? So this is interesting because I don't think, from my understanding, you, Satan is more of a, uh, is more symbolism. It's not, you don't actually worship Satan. Right. Um, I mean, if you were doing a, a ritual working, you know, you could invoke whatever gods or goddesses that you wanted. And in the Satanic Bible, you know, there is a, a, a few pages that have a list of infernal names that you can invoke in ritual. But the important thing to keep in mind is we're an atheist religion. You know, Satan is just a symbol. It's a mm -hmm. metaphor. So we don't, act, you know, we're, we're not literally trying to summon the devil or, or any other gods or goddesses. Okay. So, that, yeah, I think that's important. I think that's, that's one of the major stereotypes that, you know, that you guys, you worship Satan, you know, and, and it's not like the more I read about it, even in, in this, it, it gave me the idea like, all right, this is symbolism. It's not, they're not actually worshiping this, this, what that, what people consider Satan They're It's right. a symbol. That's it. Um, nothing more. And they, they openly admit it. So I don't know what the big deal is. And then I realized, Oh, I know what the big deal is. People don't fucking read books. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is you have, to, well, you have to ask yourself you know if you if you believed in a literal devil wouldn't you necessarily have to also then believe in a literal god and if you believe in that system why would you want to worship the loser <laughs> you know I, I guess unless you think that the bible the holy bible just got it wrong but you know right <laughs> that's I, a good point though make, I like that. I like that. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got. So, uh, okay. So, Bob Lenzinski uh, says, "What is the church's view on the afterlife, and does that match up with your belief in the afterlife?" Interesting. So, yeah, what do you what do you think about like ghosts and, for lack of a better word, demons, <laughs> and and the afterlife in general? Uh. I don't, I don't believe that there is an afterlife. Um, and since, you know, since the Church of Satan, Satanism is an atheistic religion, we right. don't believe in an afterlife. You know, we believe that this life is all you're going to get. So we're very interested in trying to make the best of it while we're here. Um, okay. Ghosts. I mean, if if ghosts were such a thing. Uh, they would have to fit in with what Anton LaVey called um, the supernormal as opposed to the supernatural. Again, since, you know, we reject an afterlife. Um, I personally, I don't believe in ghosts, but again, as a skeptic, I'm willing to be shown evidence. Um, same, same with afterlife. You know, I, I could be wrong. There could be an afterlife, but uh, I doubt it. <laughs> you sound like me dude <laughs> like yeah i don't i don't believe it i mean there could be but i doubt it <laughs> i mean that's... i mean I, I i honestly don't know what kind of evidence would you know if, if somebody asked me what kind of evidence would persuade you uh, dying being you know being wrong about that i you know i think there's go ahead the people that have supposedly had near-death experiences i, I think that there's a perfectly logical explanation that has been presented neurologically that can account for the things that they see and the things that they experience. So I tend not to, to take that as very strong, very, very compelling evidence for an afterlife. Yeah. I, I, I have the same issue with that question. Like when I'm usually asked like, all right, what kind of evidence would be sufficient enough for you to believe and I really don't know. I've tried answering it a, a few times, you know, trying to come up with scenarios which might make sense to me. But in all honesty, I, I don't know. I really don't know what kind of evidence would be sufficient. And it, I mean, it really doesn't come down to me either. It, it, it would have to be evidence that's good enough for the scientific community to say, hey, 
You know, let's let's take a look at this and then be able right. to repeat it, you know, over and over again to, to, to validate it. But yeah, I don't I don't know what kind of evidence would be sufficient. So uh, we got Tom. Tom's coming back. He says, wait, wait, wait. JD says he is an atheist, but isn't being part of the church a contradiction to the whole atheist movement? No disrespect intended. Just very curious. Uh, I would say no, because it's not, again, it's not a church in the traditional sense of, you know, you go there every Sunday and you get together and you sing songs and you, you know, you memorize a, a, a Bible verse, you know, nobody's really required to memorize verses out of a satanic Bible. and We don't do get togethers. Um, the idea of it being a, a, a church, I think, was more meant to be playful you know, mm -hmm. meant to kind of keep people's nose a bit. Um, the idea of it, of Satanism is supposed to be uh, a religion. Yes, because we have ritual, but it's, it's a religion about individualism, about celebrating the individual, not necessarily coming together to worship Satan or, or do any kind of group activities devoted to the church. I think you're right uh, from what I've read. And, and the more we talk, the more some of this is coming back to me. <laughs> um, the more with the, the, with the, the phrase about the church of Satan and how you mentioned it was like more fun. It was, it was almost like poking fun at like other churches and how serious they take it. And I agree. And I kind of liken it to skeptical inquirer uh, magazine because they, they named it skeptical inquirer to parody national inquirer. You know, like the, mm. the tabloids. So it was a serious take on the tabloids, which were, you know, stupid shit. So I think, yeah, I, I do remember something about the Church of Satan, the, the name being more of a, you know, like a poke <laughs> to to other churches. Um, so it's not necessarily a, it's not necessarily like a religion. It's, is it almost like more of like just a, it's a club? Maybe just a, a group. I mean, because you have like humanists who are atheists too, but they call them humanists. So yeah, I'm not, yeah. I mean, yeah. the difference is like humanist atheist organizations don't have ritual. They don't have mm -hmm. symbolism. Um, and I think Anton LaVey was very, um, he was very much ahead of his time in his observation about how important um, the power of, of religion could exercise on people. Okay. You know? And the idea of Satanism as kind of combining psychiatry and, and philosophy in a way that you can move away from sort of the more repressive elements of the traditional Judeo-Christian belief system but at the same time, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, you okay. can still have something that people can get emotionally invested in. Right. Um, symbols are very powerful. And I think that, uh, and, you know, certainly in, in Western culture, I think there's, there's few symbols as powerful or emotionally uh, evocative as the devil. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I mean, it, it's fun. Uh, I mean, for example, um, I can show you. This little thing, I picked this up. This came out. It's a children's book of demons. Oh, so, that's cute. It is cute. It is so cute. Is it a board it, book? It's a it's a hardback book. Yeah. It, it's uh it has your your demons and descriptions and their symbols. Um, I like that. I think I have to get one. It's beautiful. I love it. And it took me forever to get this um, because when it was released, when it was launched, it got such backlash um, mm -hmm. because it was a children's book of demons. Right. And I mean, I wanted to get it for two reasons. One, I mean, it's fucking cool. <laughs> it's a fucking children's <laughs> book of demons. Like, how? Yeah, who wouldn't want this? I don't I don't know who wouldn't want. But I also wanted to read it. You know, I wanted to see what it was about because so many people were pissed off and yet the people that I contacted that were pissed off about it 
didn't bother to read it. It was just, no, they saw right. the cover. They saw the name. Fuck it. No, they didn't want anything to do with it. Um, and the, uh, the author, Aaron, um, link, I'm going to butcher his name, Langton. I contacted him and, and spoke to him briefly, just said, you know, I, I loved it. I, I was able to find a book. I had to buy this from Canada because I couldn't get anything in the U S. Um, wow. every place was sold out. Uh, but I got when it from you- Canada. What? When did you get that? I got this probably maybe two or three months ago. Oh, so um, if I find another one, I'll let you know. Because it, well, I was it, just one, I was just wondering if it was one of those books that um, Amazon delisted. They they had it. On, it was on the site, but it was sold out. Every listing had it sold out. So yeah, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was just. People were up in arms and pissed off about it, but they didn't understand it. And when you mm-hmm. read it, it's basically it's it's no more different than a book of monsters, you know, of silly right. monsters, you know, or and, like, and, you know, a, a children's book for like Norse mythology or right, or, you know, right. Theology. It's a simple, it's cute. I mean, it, the the demons are all about like uh, if you if you summon this demon, it'll help you clean your room. You know, <laughs> and stuff like that. It's silly shit, but oh. it's fun. It's it's really cute. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, all right. Let's get on to the next question. I'm glad. I'm glad you're doing it. You doing good. You liking these questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, I hope that the answers that I'm giving are, uh, you know, intelligible. I hope so too. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Kathy asks, Are there a set of laws? that are followed as a member of the church of Satan. There is a list of, um, nine satanic sins. Again, you know, that's kind of, it's meant to be playful. They're more like behaviors that we would seek to avoid. So, um, for example, stupidity is number one, uh, pretentiousness, solipsism, self-deceit, you know, we don't have, sins in the sense of the idea that somebody's going to punish you or anything like that, but it's more holding yourself accountable, you know, because it's an atheistic individualist religion. The idea is that, you know, you are the moral center of your universe. You're ultimately responsible for your own actions and, you know, determining the standard by which you're going to hold yourself accountable. And the nine satanic uh, sins are, kind of like a guidelines as far as behaviors that you would want to avoid. Okay. That's cool. That, that totally reminded me of like a uh, pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> it's like, they're not long. Right. long. They're, it's more like a guideline. <laughs> I like that. And it, you know what? That's, that's the, I want to say like more relaxed, easygoing nature of, of that I found in, in, the satanic Mm -hmm. bible it wasn't like very strict you didn't have to do everything it was more or less like this is what we think you know if you want to follow it it's up to you i mean we've always or the church of satan as far as, as as i can tell has always maintained that satanists are born not made so it's not a religion for everybody we don't proselytize you know, we have no expectations of converting, you know, converting people or finding new members. It, you know, if if you, you read the Satanic Bible, you identify with it, you know, you you consider yourself a Satanist. That's, you know, that's yeah. good for you. It almost feels more like a lifestyle. Because when I read this, I I did relate a lot to it. And again, I read this maybe like 10 years ago. So I'm not I'm not up to date on on what it says but i do remember and i'm pretty sure i wrote notes in here and i underlined stuff because i was like wow you know like this is what i think this is what i think on a daily basis and this is kind of how i react to people or how i treat people you know and and i can really relate to this so i'm I'm right there with you in the in the in all the years that you know the, the satanic bible has been in print and the church of satan has been out that's like the number one thing that people say when they when they read it is you know wow i've always 
kind of thought this or I've always behaved this way, you know. So it's more seeing yourself reflected in the writing as opposed right. to kind of being changed by it. And it really comes down to one of those cases where don't comment about it unless you read it. You know, like if you don't know, if you haven't read it, you don't know what's in it. So mm-hmm. shut the fuck up <laughs> kind of thing. Well, that's my opinion. <laughs> I, I, I go through that a lot because it, it like arguing over books and, and what books are good and what books are not. And it's like, all right, I read the book. Did you? And it's usually like, no, they, they didn't read the book. So, right. so let's move on here. These are good. I'm glad we're getting some good questions here. There's a bunch more coming. So Kathy says, is an oath taken when you become a member? No, 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 no. You pretty much apply, you know, answer the set of questions, um, pay your membership due. And if you're accepted, you know, you get your membership card in the mail and that's it. It's, and I do it's believe not- you guys have badass looking membership cards. Oh, he's got it. I mean, you kind of can't really see it, but you know, okay. yeah, little red, little red cards. Um, it's, uh, it's not, yeah. it's not. Um, what would you call it? Like the, like the Freemasons. It's not like an. Um, there's a word I'm specifically trying to think of. I can't think of it right now, but like an initiate, initiatory kind of. Okay. You know, there's not. There's not like a ceremonial induction. You know, right. there's not an expectation of memorizing certain passages that you have to recite. Um, yeah, sure. there's a, a friend of yeah. mine, uh, Rob Palmer. He's uh, another columnist with the Skeptical Inquirer, and he's a Wikipedia editor. Uh, he joined. He has his membership card, and it was exactly how he, how you, you described it. He, I, I think he was at, I forget where he was, but there was a, uh, a main office. Um, and he walked in and he talked to them and they said, yeah, if you want to just fill, fill this out, answer a few questions. And, you know, and he did, he paid the fee and then he got his membership card and he was very proud of it <laughs> because I, and it was cool. I was like, damn, that's a badass membership card. <laughs> I want one of those. <laughs> now, I got to tell you, the best thing is um, I had never seen them. Like I, I knew it was called a red card and I, you know, I had a certain expectation of what it was going to look like, but I had never seen one. Um, I don't even know if there's any pictures on, there might be some pictures online, no. but I had, um, but when I did finally get mine in the mail, I was like, damn, this is cool. Like, <laughs> that, you know, it is worth it just to get this card. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, I mean, when I saw it and I think there's like different ones, if you go online to do it, there was different, uh, styles of, of membership cards. So member, I'm trying to look it up now so I can share. I remember, I remember correctly. Um, the first original cards were, um, trapezoidal shaped. And then at some point, you know, they phased that out to more of a standard kind of business card format. Right. So, all okay, right, I'm going to see if I can do this because this would be, Oh, wait, Chrome tab and boom. we'll put that. There you go. Put that on the side. We'll get rid of the, uh, our frame here for a second so we can see it all. But there's, that's the red card, right? This is, this is for a different group. Oh we, shit. Well, that, uh, that makes me look idiot. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry different different part okay so is this wait so the satanic temple and the site the church of satan are two different organizations yes okay wow so i don't feel stupid <laughs> i totally do let me get back here all right so i'll have to look up i'll look up the cards later um and i'll go to another question so i don't look as stupid and prolong my stupidity <laughs> question for jd do you have a secret handshake oh my god jokes aside have you ever been vilified for your beliefs online or in life oh that's a good question so far no um i suppose that could change depending on how uh how much traffic my podcast gets but 
you know, I'm not really um, a more prominent member. I'm not obviously not a celebrity, um, just kind of an average person. I don't necessarily make my affiliation secret, but I also don't kind of go around parading it, you know, telling right. every person that I, that I meet that, that I'm a member of the church of Satan. Um, because you know, you, you do never know how some people are going to react. You know, they're, you know, you never know who's going to be really kind of a true blue believer that, you know, demons are real and you're probably actually not up to any good. Okay. Hmm. So far, knock on wood, nobody's. nobody's <laughs> well, that's fun. good. That's good. I've been, you know what? Like, I, uh, the only time I've ever like felt, uh, I guess the prejudice is when I've gone to some festivals that had like a religious booth, uh, more like a, a very devout Christian kind of group. And I would walk up and just start talking like casual conversation, not mm -hmm. nothing confrontational, just like, Oh, what are you about? And this and that. And it, it's happened two or three times where the person was like, Oh, so, you know, do you believe in God? And I would say, no. And that was it. Like mm -hmm. they would say, all right, I'll, I don't need to talk to you anymore. And then would walk away from me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do. I have you had any kind of like that. Any, any, any conversations that went that, that way? None that I can really recall. I mean, <clears throat> everybody is going to run into the occasional, you know, street proselytizer. Right. But, you know, I, I kind of treat people on an individual basis. You know, if yeah. you're being a dick, I'm going to treat you like a dick. You know, <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're being kind and you're proselytizing, I'm probably just going to say, you know, no, thank you. Not interested. I um, hear you. When I was when I was in high school, you know, and I first read the Satanic Bible when I was, you know, when I was a kid, I, I was a lot more confrontational about things. So. You know, people would ask me, you know, do you believe in God or the devil? You know, I'd probably give a much less polite answer than just a simple no. But, you know, that was like, God, who knows how many years ago. Right. Eventually, you kind of you grow up and grow out of what we kind of call uh, first phase Satanism. Mm -hmm. And you learn that, you know, there's more to life than just kind of trying to get a rise out of people. Right. And trying to constantly project an aura of you know look at me i'm a badass you know i read the satanic bible and you know yeah hopefully most people grow up and kind of mature out of that and i think uh you know again unless you're kind of wearing wearing it on your sleeve most people will probably let you alone most people honestly probably will just assume that you're a christian yeah i think i think it it definitely is that bias that that core belief kind of bias where you work you, you grow up and you just kind of think everyone is the same as you, you know, and that's the way mm -hmm. I grew up. Like I grew up again, like in a, a predominantly Catholic neighborhood. And that's what I thought everyone was until I got to high school. And after high school, I was like, wow, there's different people out here. Holy shit. Not everyone. is the same as me. And I felt really weird, but all right. Now, so when you're a you uh, work that to your advantage, because, you know, you've probably most likely read the Bible front to back and, you know, probably know a little bit more than the average person. So if they de facto assume that you're one of them, you can kind of talk the language and, you know, it sounds really good, really, you know, kind of impressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's one thing, too. I mean, on the other side of it, <clears throat> like I talk about we, we've talked about people not reading the Satanic Bible and therefore not knowing what's in it. But the same goes for the Christian Bible. I mean, the, you know, like most Christians that I know haven't actually read the Bible. You know, they haven't right. taken the time to go through it. And and I, that's what I used to do too. Um, um, lunch breaks, I would read through it. Not because I wanted to be more spiritual or religious. I wanted to know what, what was in there. You know, what, mm -hmm. and I used to keep, I mean, this is probably going to, I don't know if this will piss off, probably not anybody in this chat room, but I used to keep a list of God's kill count. And as I, <laughs> as I read through, I was keeping track of how many people he, he, the God character killed, or he killed through other people, like gave the order to mm -hmm. kill. I had two lists. Right. 
going. And it was just ridiculous how many hundreds of thousands of people, you know, were killed <laughs> in this, in this, you know, play, the story. I mean, uh, considering that we, you know, the, the kind of culture that we live in, I think there's also a certain, you can't, you, you can't partake in the cult, you know, the greater conversation of the culture if you don't get like all the references, you know, if somebody right. makes a biblical reference and you don't pick up on that, that's something that you're missing out on. So right. even if you don't necessarily identify or believe in the religion at the same time, you know, it's a rather prominent piece of literature through history. You know, it's probably, um, probably would benefit you to, to keep up on it. So let's see. Bob says, one of the reasons that I am agnostic is because of science. How does your belief in science mesh with your belief system? So for me, I, I consider like my identification with the character of the devil is with him as Lucifer, as a figure of the enlightenment, as somebody who kind of tempts mankind to, I mean, in, in Genesis, the story is that the devil supposedly tempts Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, that to me says it all, you know, the character of, of Satan as somebody who tempts mankind towards more forbidden knowledge and the application of that knowledge to a more rewarding life in this world. So, you know, as an atheist, I, I'm not, not overly concerned with an afterlife. I'm more interested in what I can do to make my life in the here and now more enjoyable. And I think that the, the benefits that science has, has given, you know, all of mankind are pretty tangible in that, especially with regards to things like vaccines, better food production, you know, understanding natural phenomena and how better to kind of protect ourselves, you know, against that. Right. Awesome. Good job. Uh, let's see. Megan, Megan's in here. I don't know if she's talking to us or talking. She's having a debate in the chat room, but she says, but people rather go off of stereotypes versus put in time to research, even with much information at their fingertips these days. Oh, I think she's referring to what we were talking about earlier, how it's much easier today to, to research things. And, and I would have to agree with her because it, it's just, it's much easier to go off a stereotype than put in the work that, that requires, uh, you know, sometimes five minutes. <laughs> um, sometimes it takes m much longer, but oftentimes if you, if you do a Google search for five freaking minutes, you can learn a lot um, and, and blow away those stereotypes. So awesome. Uh, let's see, Bob, Bob's hitting with the questions again. You have the stereotype of Satanists sacrificing animals, yet the Bible, Old Testament, seems to accept human sacrifice. So it's funny to see Christians who bring up these supposed rituals. <laughs> I agree. That is funny. I mean, you also have the Bible that have, you know, talking animals, talking bushes, um, <laughs> lots of fairy tale items. And yeah, uh, I, I guess when anyone else does it, and, and I don't mean, I'm not trying to pick on uh, Christians. Um, that's just what I know more than anywhere, anywhere else. I, I don't know too many other, uh, uh, religious factions. So I don't know too much about the Jewish. Um, I don't know about, uh, Buddhism. I don't know about Muslim as much as I know about Christianity because that's how I grew up. So, right. so it's, it's natural to keep going and re referencing them right. than any others. So I don't mean to pick on them. Uh, it's, it's kind of within your wheelhouse as yeah, opposed to exactly uh, if you're talking about other religions. It's, it's kind of secondhand. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't mean to, you know, offend anyone in particular, but it, it certainly seems to be the case that historically Christianity has been a very death obsessed religion. I mean, you know, it centers around, a dead guy on a cross um and the stereotype about you know human sacrifices and sacrificing black cats and things like that you know those were kind of stereotypes that that zealous christians 
forced on people that they accused of witchcraft and things like that. So it's all coming from the same place, in in my opinion. One of the, the stereotypes that always fascinated me, <laughs> and this shouldn't come to a surprise, is the thing about orgies. Like, I grew up <laughs> hearing, like, you guys, <laughs> and what do you mean you guys? But you guys did, like, these black masses, and it was nothing but orgies and naked people all over the place and i gotta tell you my teenage mind was like oh yeah <laughs> i'm into that <laughs> I mean, you know we, ha we have the nude altars um you know there's you know you can see anton LaVey on video you know conducting rituals in the black house and he's you know he's got the nude altar so you know we're definitely i think the sexiest religion I, I'm not going to disagree with that. I definitely but, think. And I think that that's, again, you know, to kind of speak to how ahead of his time Anton LaVey was and how pragmatic Satanism as a religion. In the Satanic Bible, there's a chapter that specifically deals with the issue of sex and Satanism. Because, you know, again, that was a lot of people's you know, kind of draw to it was the question of, okay, but you know, where, you know, where's all the orgies? Where can I, you know, where can I get in on that? You know, and he specifically pointed out that you don't necessarily have to have that kind, you know, have an orgy to have an indulgent and satisfied sex life. As long as you're doing what, you know, is good for you, that's all that matters. You know, the church of Satan's not necessarily about orgies um, and, and having, you know, having all that kind of sex that you want, you know, if you don't, you know, if, if you're asexual, that's fine too. It, you know, it, it all comes back to the individual and, and mm -hmm. what you consider to be uh, fulfilling for you. Very good. I, I like that. Uh, let's see. Um, Bob's up here again. You mentioned that Satan is used as a symbol for the church. Why use Satan? Why not the creation in quotes, uh, for lack of a better term, of a deity or just use some other symbol? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I I obviously didn't know Anton LaVey personally, but from reading the Satanic Bible and from reading other books that he wrote, books about him, I think that he was obviously somebody who was very literate, and he drew inspiration from the mythical figure of Satan in the same way that writers like Twain or, or Byron or Shelley drew inspiration from him as a symbol of kind of the penultimate rebel, um, a very individualistic uh, person. So I think that when he decided that, you know, the time was right to kind of take all the elements that he already had working in the occult and kind of synthesize that into a new religion. Satan was a very natural uh, kind of figurehead. I, I think like with this and then the last question, I, I, I'm drawing a, um, a parallel to theatrics. Like it really goes back to theatrics. And when you think about um, the, the, a lot of the videos, most of the videos that I've seen of Anton LaVey, um, it's very theatrical but he he took it to another level. But when you look at other religions and their their rituals, and we've been talking about rituals um, tonight, it's it's all the same thing. It's it's pretty much all theatrics. Everything mm -hmm. like the Christian slash Catholic masses, um, the the Jewish uh, uh, I don't know what they call it um, rituals, but it's all theatric. It's all part of like a, a play almost that they go through. And I think Anton, he just, he had fun with it. You know, like it's a good show. It really is. Yeah. Whenever I, I remember being young and looking at these videos, which I probably was not allowed to look at, but I, I watched them and I was like, Oh my, you know, Holy shit. This is, this guy's dressed as the devil. And you know, there's a naked chick over here which is cool i like that but you know there's all these freaky stuff going on but now when i look at them now i'm like mm. oh, that looks like i mean that that's pretty much any horror movie that you see <laughs> you yeah. know yeah 
Well, we really all religion is show business. It's just yeah. that we're the only one that's honest about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I agree. It's 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 show business. It's it's creating a show to get viewers, and it, it's about a, rating. Having a good time doing it too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He. <laughs> oh yeah. Let's see. Uh, I'm looking through comments here. Uh, Kathy, we're getting against a click. I don't know. I'm going through. I'm trying to catch up on the questions. So let's see, J. Uh, let's see, Bob, JD, are you knocking these questions out of? Oh, you are knocking these questions out of the park. I thought he was asking me. I was like, "Well, I sure hope so." I know. <laughs> <laughs> He's learning a lot. That's good. That's the point of this. And, and that's, that's, that's the entire reason that I wanted to talk to you. Cause you know, I know, I know we touched on your podcast and, and um, like the article that you wrote and I know there's other work that you've done. You sent me a little notes um, over the last week or so about stuff you've done, but I know this was probably the most, most interest because I don't think anyone um, that's watching was like, holy shit, you know, we get to ask questions freely of someone that's a member of this, that it's, it's a stereotype that people are afraid to ask, but I'm glad that people are learning. I'm glad Bob's learning stuff. I'm hoping, hoping everyone else does. Um, let's see. Oh, Marcus, Marcus hoodie Lang. I like that hoodie. What does Satanism say about how one should treat another person? Is any kind of behavior justified towards another or is that another misconception? Thanks. I mean, first of all, I would say the Church of Satan is a law-abiding organization. They do not condone any kind of criminal activity. Um, but we, you know, we don't believe in turning the other cheek. You know, if if, if somebody wrongs you you have every right to be offended and, you know, to seek some kind of, uh, recompense, you know, uh, right. I always, I look at it as, you know, if you treat me with respect, I will, you know, treat you likewise. If you're a dick, I'm going to treat you like a dick. You know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't take, you know, we don't take shit and we don't believe that, that anybody else should, you know, uh, that's, that's awesome. And I explored that a little bit. I was talking, uh, I did an interview um, about a week, week or two ago with a uh, nine-year-old L, um, L the Humanist. She wrote a book called L the Humanist, um, and it, it's adorable young lady. I, I, I love talking to her and her father, and it was great. And she brought up the point of treating people how they want to be treated. So you're looking right. at things from their perspective which I think is great. I, I love that idea because not everyone's the same. Not everyone, everyone expects to be treated the same. So that's what I try to do. I, and that's one of the things that I, I did find in this um, when I read it, like you're not just turning the other cheek. You're not letting someone walk all over you. You can, you can be respectful. You can talk to somebody, you can treat them how you, how they want to be treated and everything's goes fine. But if they, like you said, if, if they're a dick, you can be a dick right back to them. And, and I fully support that because, you know, some people are assholes and you need to do that. Uh, and, and if you don't, then people are going to walk all over you. Right. And I think that's how you got a lot of weak people because they just, they, they shrug up, they turn, they tuck their tail between their legs and they let people walk over them. And that's not, that's not a good thing. That doesn't, that doesn't help you progress as a person. I mean, you know, it, it is a very uh, law of the jungle kind of mentality, but, you know, we do believe in, in a social contract, you know, like it or not, you are born into a world with other individuals. You are, you know, a, a, an animal that lives in a society of other animals. So you have to figure out how to navigate that. Um, and, you know, certainly the kind of victim mentality of, always having to turn the other cheek, you know, that, like you said, that's just going to, you know, people are just going to walk all over you and take advantage of you like that. Right. All right. So we got Dave. I'm not sure if, I think we've kind of touched on, on, on this a little bit, but Dave says, since Christians mentioned Satan, how are the Christian gods 
and deities mentioned in satanic churches. Um, you, I mean, you really, you really don't have churches, though, right? No, there, yeah, there's not. Again, it's not, it's not a religion in that there's churches where we get together and and congregate. Um, Christian gods, other deities, you know, we all consider them, you know, fictitious. They're in, you know, they were invented by humans to, you know, kind of be projections of people's own individual needs and desires or the needs and desires, I guess, of a particular culture. Mm -hmm. So we, we consider them, uh, you know, fantasy. Right. I mean, historically the gods were, were created by man in order to explain things, explain phenomena like the sun and the stars and, and, you know, weather, um, Thor, I mean, <laughs> God of thunder, like, you know, it was used to explain that stuff. So I think gradually over time, uh, some people kind of got the idea like, oh, we could use this to our advantage and, and create like a set of rules, um, that would put us in power. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, all right. We have, I don't know if this is a follow-up to another one, but Kathy says, so basically, according to what I'm hearing so far, is that it's all just based only on the name of the church. Members are mostly atheists and there's no structure within the setting. There's no structure in terms of like a laity. You know, there's not like bishops or cardinals or anything like that. I mean, we do... We, we do have a leader, um, current high priest, Peter Gilmore, has been leading the church since 2001, I believe. Before, before you know, long before I was a member. Okay. Um, we have uh, members who have the title of, of, you know, priest. But it's not, it's not an organization like you get a title and there's certain responsibilities that come along with that. The titles are more an acknowledgement from central of your own personal accomplishments. And that can be, you know, whatever, you know, you know whatever it is that you specialize in. It's all okay. about showing how they're demonstrating how you have applied the philosophy to get the most out of your life and better, you know, enrich your life. Hmm. <clears throat> so it's not like a fraternal organization, like with the Freemasons where, um, you know, there's initiations and you have to answer a set of questions or go through some kind of formal ritual where you recite something and then you get a fancy title. Right. So is there, besides the, the, the leader, um, and you said Peter, Peter, what? Peter, Peter Gilmore. Okay. So is there more of a hierarchy? Is there like people below him and how's that? Not, not in the sense of like direct reports. Um, okay. Uh, there's people who I think like the next step down would be Magister, Magus. I mean, again, the the titles are handed out more as an acknowledgement of your individual accomplishments. It's okay. not like you direct report to somebody like the Pope, for example. Okay. All right. Are you digging these questions so far? Are you liking this? I hope, I'm, hope I'm answering them. Uh <laughs> I know it's it's very hard sometimes to do a, like a live Q and A. So I mean, I'm, I think you're doing great. Uh, Thank you. It's it's definitely hard sometimes. That's why I usually drink because it's <laughs> much easier to answer questions. When I drink. Blame it on the booze. There you go. If I get it wrong, I get it wrong. But oh well. I'm more concerned about rambling on incoherently because I have a tendency to do that. So oh, it's okay. To, I think to keep my know. answer you know, to the point. Okay. So Bob says, as part of my studies in history, I have done a lot of research on religions and prejudice against any religion just baffles me because so many people do not even know half of what their religion preaches. I agree. So it's not a question. It's more of a statement. But yes, I agree. Uh, when you really get into what if you follow a religion, uh, like uh, as I mentioned many times, I grew up Catholic. So. I didn't realize how prejudiced they were until I got older and could look back on it with uh, what I would think was a more objective view. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a lot of prejudice. I saw a lot of people 
saying it, that there were a lot of terms like, oh, they are so-and-so, but that's okay. And we pretty much ignore them. You know, yeah. and I, I didn't understand why I just went along with it because that, you know, that that's how I was uh, uh, brought up. But yeah, a lot of prejudice against people because they didn't believe the same things. And it, it's, I mean, same, I, I, I agree, Bob, it, it's, it baffles me. Like, I don't understand how people can be so upset and write someone off just because they don't believe the same things you do. Ugh. So let's see. We got the Sparky is in the chat room. He grew up in Catholic school. I don't know. If this is not a. This is more of a statement than a question. I went to Catholic school through high school. We went through the entire Bible many times. Follow Jesus' teachings, especially the Gospel of John. By follow, I mean this is who I want to be. I don't believe the Old Testament has any meaning other than to foretell the coming of Christ. So. I mean, that, that's, hey, you got to be you, you know, like if that's for you, then then you do you. That's basically what it is. Um, the Old Testament is pretty much the, the the Jewish version, right? That's the that's pretty much what Christians stole from <laughs> from the Jews and, and made it their Old Testament. Um, uh, but otherwise, I mean, yeah, I mean. That's what I say. If that's your thing, if that's what makes you feel good, then go with it. And I think that's the that's the basic philosophy of Satanism. <laughs> is if if go ahead. Yeah, if if it works for you know if it works for you, that's that's fine. You know, we're we're not in the business of trying to you know look for new members or you know convert anybody. Um, I say, you know, live and let live as long as you're not trying to, you know, force your beliefs on me in, in any, any kind of way, you know, right. Do you know, you do you. And that's, that's something that I've always, I I've, I've talked about and it's not just religion is it's paranormal stuff. Um, because I, I definitely am more into the, the ghost hunting, uh, uh, niche of, of these hobbies, these, uh, fringe hobbies, if you will, that, you can you can believe anything you want. I'm I'm not out to change your beliefs. Um, if my information that I provide changes your beliefs, it's on you. Like mm -hmm. you made that decision to change your belief. I'm not out to change anyone. I'm not out to recruit anyone. Uh, and I'm cool with anyone just talking about their own stuff. But when you start preaching to others and and pretty much has that that aspect of you need to believe this. You have to believe this. That's when I have a problem. Mm -hmm. Because now you're you're trying to force your beliefs onto somebody else, and usually with no supporting evidence whatsoever. I mean, well, when you're talking about a lot of faith-based um, religions, there is no evidence. It, it's it's faith, um, which I don't. I know I understand the concept. I just don't buy into it. I don't like that concept, um, and that's just me. So, oh, look at this. Bob, Bob gave you another compliment. Look at this. Kenny, I told you last week that I was interested in this topic. I reactivated my Facebook account just to be here. <laughs> wow. So look at this. You have a fan. Bob, I say go online and I'll, I'll actually send you a link. Um, I, have to, I have to look up the link again. But the, the podcast that he does is called The Devil in the Details. He's got three episodes up. I love all three and I'm not saying that because he's a guest and he's on the show right now. I'm saying that because I actually, he sent me the link. You sent me the link to the first two episodes and just asked for my opinion, my honest opinion, which I, I gave you um, after I, I listened to him and I was very impressed. I didn't know what to expect. We've never, I don't think we've actually spoken before tonight, right? No, no. Okay. So I, I had no preconceived notions. I didn't know what, except for the casual, like when he commented, I knew about him. So, cause everyone that comments on my pages, I look up. <laughs> it's just a OCD with me. I need to know who's looking stuff up, but. Well, you uh, want to like, try to weed out. Yeah. The, 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 the nut cases yeah. <laughs> that are really, really bad. Um, but it was, it was a pleasant surprise because the podcasts are, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, kissing your ass here, but they were very, very well researched. And 
I think when you have when you have all the information in front of you, you are a very good speaker and, and it flows really well. And you don't hold back. You almost sound like I want to say like the podcast sounds like you're a very nice person. And it's like, oh, well, you know, he's very nice. It's calming. It's easy to listen to. And then all of a sudden, like you come out with, oh, and this statement. Yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, he cursed. Holy shit. All right. So, oh, I like this. Well, it, it's it's kind of hard to get fired up about something that's not like an informal conversation, you know? Right. So I suppose uh, if it was if it was a show where I had a guest and it was a kind of repartee between the two of us, maybe that would come through more. Um, OK, but it was, hard, it was hard finding a balance between entertaining and educational because i really I, I do really want it to be educational i want someone to feel like after they've listened to an episode if they didn't go out and like buy the books themselves they could still kind of talk competently about the subject mm -hmm. or if they heard somebody else talking about it they would be like oh okay i know you know i, I know that i know that person i know what you're talking about very good Kathy says, cool. Thank you. I have like 10 minutes left. Thank you for answering my questions. So that's good. See, you got positive reviews here. I like it. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, Bill Freeman. Oh, hey, Bill. Organized religion is a form of brainwashing. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, let's see. Bob, Bob has a good question. Bob is on fire tonight with the questions. I love it. How does someone become a high priest? Uh, is it based on a council? Who decides it? Do all members get a say? So the the current high priest, Peter Gilmore, was appointed by the previous head of the Church of Satan, um, Magister Blanche Barton, who took over after Anton LaVey's death. Um He's been high priest since I, I believe 2001. He's been he's been high priest for as long as I've known about the Church of Satan. Um, and it, like I said, basically it was it was handed to him, and I imagine you know he will hand it to whoever he considers to be a fitting successor to the church. Okay, so it's more like you know whoever is currently at the top says, okay, I want to pass it off to this person. Right. Okay. Um, cause again, you know, you, there's been, you know, there's been times in the past when people, you know, thought that they could get more than maybe what they were really capable of. And they yeah. either left the organization in a huff and went and started their own thing. You know, our leadership's in good hands and it, it always has been as far as the, you know, the structure goes you apply for active membership and that's it. Every title that comes after that then is kind of an invitation that's extended to you, you know, so you don't, okay. it's not a constant application process. You can't, uh, you can't appeal for other titles. Okay. Well, that makes sense. There's, okay. there's no real, there's no responsibilities or, or, you know, perks or anything that come with the other titles, except for an acknowledgement of, you know, we've we've seen the accomplishments that you've made. Good job. You know, okay. we're I, I guess you know we're proud of you in some sense. Good. All right. So let's see. Uh, oh, look at this. Bob just subscribed to JD's podcast at the <laughs> at the beginning of this meeting, and uh, yeah. and I need the name of the po your podcast too, Kenny. Oh, you're not getting that. Fuck you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you just subscribe live. You keep your Facebook profile active just so you can turn tune in every Friday night. So there. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Tim Vickers. Hey Tim. Tim's uh, one of my co-hosts. Uh we we all me, him, and Dave Schumacher co-host a another podcast on Saturdays called uh, Three Tortured Souls. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I listened to the first one on your retcom and enjoyed it. Well done. And the quality of the production is very nice. There you go. Look at that. A compliment on your podcast. Thank you. Very cool. Now I have to, I have to full disclosure. Yes. 
those three episodes right now are pretty much it. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I put, the, I, I, I had those done. I put those out and I, I specifically had like a deadline that I set for getting everything done. Okay. Um, and I didn't really want to go whole hog and produce a bunch of episodes. I wasn't really sure that anybody was going to care. So I, I, I got the three that I have to a point where I was, I was happy with them and I figured I'd put them out there and I'd wait and see and, you know, get people's feedback and see if there was anything that people thought that, uh, you know, could be done better. You know, right. Was the sound quality terrible? Was it boring? Um, I definitely have ideas for future episodes, but I'm just throwing out the caveat. Those three are going to kind of be it for now. So well, stay, stay tuned, but don't <laughs> you know, wait. With me to stay tuned. I'm, I, I really like them and I really, really encourage you to do more. Um, I think the topics were good. The topics were, they, they were very in the genre of stereotype. So it clarified a lot of details. It clarified a lot of information for me personally. So I understood the, the events better. Um, the players, the characters in the, in the stories, I understood them better and, you know, realized some were fucking fucked up, <laughs> you know, it, it's oh, it gets better. It, it gets better. <laughs> the, the episode that I'm currently brainstorming is, the, you know the the individual that that that, that episode is going to focus on it's a wild and crazy story um but that was the one that was the one thing that that i really kind of discovered when i was researching and you know writing writing the ideas up for the episodes um was i i, I hadn't found anything that really kind of did that deep dive like everybody kind of knows what the satanic panic is and i think most rational people understand that it was a, a case of mass hysteria there's never been any kind of evidence of you know satanic cults but i couldn't really find much in the way of specific details as far as who were the principal players and you know how could it be that that rational otherwise intelligent well maybe not rational but otherwise intelligent adults you know kind of come in you know, believe this sort of thing, especially among like the psychiatric community, for example, right. that's the one, the one I really kind of want to build like a crescendo towards is discussing the idea of repressed memories and false memories and understanding how that plays into the greater narrative of believing in satanic ritual abuse, because that's the part that kind of blows my, like, I'm perfectly willing to accept that people who are devoutly religious are going to believe things no matter what. But the idea that people who have a PhD and, you know, have all these years of experience as like practicing psychiatrists and therapists and whatever could come to believe this and, and believe it on what they considered to be scientific grounds. That's the part that, that interested me the most was how many, it was how so many people who are, otherwise intelligent could could kind of come to 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 believe that and then to you know propagate that belief right and it seemed like a lot of uh i mean and, and i'm going off the last episode because that's most recent that i listened to but it, it seems like a lot of the the quote-unquote evidence is anecdotal there there oh, wasn't well, yeah there, go ahead there's you see it more in other cases. So one of the more, one of the most famous um, court cases that came out of the whole satanic panic was the McMartin trial. And I'll have to be covering that. And I'm sure, you know, anybody that's familiar with the satanic panic has probably heard about it, but you do see some questionable scientific evidence that was brought forward um in support of the idea of satanic ritual abuse but yes for the for the for the most part it was anecdotal and it was purely a matter of because somebody was considered an expert the assumption was made that they knew what they were talking about or mm -hmm. because you know, children specifically 
said something. Why would children lie? You know, it must have happened. If you don't believe that what the, you know, what a child said was true, then, you know, either you're complicit or you're uh, enabling, you right. know. Um, in some cases, I think part of it had to do with a lack of understanding at the time about the power of like coercive interview techniques and understanding how exactly memory operated. You know, you got to remember this was back in the late seventies, early eighties, that this really started happening. Our understanding of the, the, the processes of how recall and recognition actually work have drastically changed since then. Right. So I think a lot of cases, people didn't really understand what was really going on with the false memories that were coming forward in these therapy sessions. Hmm. So you have, you know, credulity and devout religious belief on the one hand, and then you also kind of have bad science on the other. Right. Yeah. It really seemed like, cause going back to like, like something you said about why would a child lie? And, and I mean, I hear that a lot in the paranormal community, like why would a child lie or why would anyone else lie? Um, you know, like they're not trying to make money or they're not trying to get fame and stuff like that. But it really is. I mean, with, with children, children have active imaginations and, and they can create a story and it, it's not something that's, it's, you know, they're, they're consciously trying to do. They're not consciously trying to deceive everyone. It's they're right. storytellers. I mean, they're natural storytellers. So they're, they're going to create the narrative as they go along. Adults, yeah, they might not be making money off this, but yes, mm -hmm. adults do it for the attention. They like the attention. They, they crave it and it becomes an addiction to them um, where they want the spotlight. So anecdotal evidence to me is has always been something more of hey this is a, a direction that we need to go and investigate but not mm -hmm. necessarily it's it's not solid evidence to me right um, it's always been a point like it, it's a pointer saying look in this direction that's about mm -hmm. it you know and I mean, and, some of the claims, you know like the specific claims were were just completely outrageous you know like easily disproven and and never should have believed in the first place. You know, right. it's not like with the Salem witch trials, it's, you know, if you believe that somebody is literally like flying around the room and they're invisible and you can't really see them, you know, right. Rational discourse has totally gone out the window at this point. You know, there's no, there's probably no reaching that person. Yeah. So how long does it take? Uh, like when you, you've done three episodes so how about how long has it taken for you to research and record each episode i'd say probably gosh maybe at least maybe at least two months yeah something like that. It, it it it's been a really chaotic process because again I've never done anything like this before. So I'm, you know, kind of teaching myself everything each step of the way. So I, I kind of had ideas in my head of what I was going to talk about. And then it's kind of just sitting down and kind of just hammering it out each, you know, each episode right. as it happened. Recording is actually like recording can take about, a, I want to, I want to think about how I want to say this. <laughs> so with 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 my full-time job and you know my commitments with my family and everything right i pretty much get like one day a week that i can spend like the entire day writing or recording mm. so i can record an episode in a single day and then it's a matter of taking the time to listen to it play back edit it get it to a point where i think that it sounds good so right. that part isn't necessarily the most difficult. It's more getting the writing where it's at and getting the episode to where I think it sounds good. It covers all the points that I want it to. And I think it sounds like it's going to be fun. Okay. I can, I can, I can totally relate. <laughs> I mean, I do anytime I do videos uh, specifically for YouTube, uh, I'm 
always trying to the balance between getting all the information out there to educate and then making it fun and, and interesting. So people will mm-hmm. actually tune in and want to watch it. Um, right. So yeah, it's always that balance. And I think you get better as you, as time goes on, at least that's what I tell myself. So I keep doing it. <laughs> um, right, right. So yeah, I can totally relate to that. Um, we're getting close to the end here. So I'm going to say we're going to start wrapping up. And uh, if, if there's anything, what do you have coming up? Um, what do you, do you have any projects coming up? Maybe like the next episode or two that you m- might be planning out and any events that you might be coming up in the future once this pandemic is over and we're allowed to go outside. <laughs> um, I, I have the ideas for the episodes in my head. Um, I sat down the other day and was actually trying to kind of write out the script for the, the next one. Um, it's going to be about a book called uh, Satan's Underground written by uh, a person called Lauren Stratford. Um, and then I'm probably going to do an episode on the McMartin trial And then um, a third episode kind of specifically talking about um, false memories. And that's kind of, I I think that's the crescendo that I kind of want to build, build to. So it's a nice um, six, six episode series. That's good. Yeah. You'll build up, you'll keep building up and then get right into the the meat of it. The, the, yeah. I like that. Cause, um, cause Lawrence, the, the the individual Lauren Stratford kind of is tangentially involved with the McMartin trial, kind of like on the outskirts of, of what's going on. And the McMartin trial is kind of the most famous uh, court case to come out of this. So mm-hmm. it's building towards that. And then also, you know, I make the case in I, I believe episode one that the theory of false memories is kind of the, the best evidence that was, pre- you know, that was ever presented in support of the conspiracy theory around the satanic panic. So cool. everything kind of builds towards that. And I think that the theory itself kind of stands or falls with that. And, you know, we'll, we'll see, see cool. what happens with that. Then we got, uh, if you don't mind one more question from Bob, let's see. Sure. Uh, let me see if I can get this up. There you go. Bob says, I may have missed this if it was addressed, but what made you want to start a podcast? I have been back and forth about starting one, looking for some inspiration, and both of you can answer this if you wish. So you can go first. So for me, I honestly looked to see if anybody had done anything similar before, because I figured surely somebody more qualified than I, than I am has. And I honestly couldn't really find anything that that dealt with the subject in the kind of detail that I wanted or treated it. I, I, I honestly had seen things that were indicating misinformation, and that didn't sit well with me. You know, I, I feel if you're going to spend the time to put something out there, everything that you say should be backed up. And if somebody questions you on it, you should be able to say, I got this from, you know, from here. Absolutely. Because if you, if somebody uncritically listens to it, they're going away now with a misconception and anybody that they talk to, they're spreading that. So I wanted to put something out there that kind of did a deep dive, went into the kind of detail that I I couldn't and collected all the information from different sources. Cause again, you know, if somebody involved in the subject put out a book, I'm reading that book. I'm going by that book. If somebody wrote a book talking about that person or that book, I'm going to book, you know, I wanted something that kind of took all those different sources and, and, and brought them all together in one accessible place. So if you're somebody that, didn't want to buy all those books and do all that reading, you could still kind of get a pretty good idea of the subject. Right. Very good. Very good. Uh, for me, Bob, uh, I don't, I don't know if you, I think this is a, a, a vlog. I don't, I don't know what you would call this. It does go out as a podcast after I'm done. So I upload the video or the audio to uh, a podcast center and it goes out to all the major podcasts 
platform. So I guess it is a podcast. But for me, the reason I do this uh, every week is because I do have some knowledge. I do have some decent knowledge. I, I'm not perfect. Definitely, I'm not perfect. Um, I do have have gaps in my information, which other people do help me with. But I do have a lot of knowledge when it comes to like photography and video um, to, to solving mysteries. I mean, that's that's what I do when I'm not working my real job. I'm solving mysteries most of the time. So I do have skills in that. And I like to be able to come on um, and, and, and give that information out to help others improve the quality of their work. And I also enjoy the interaction. I, I actually love going to conferences. Um, I love going to science conferences. I love going to paranormal conferences. Um, I really do like going to both and, and like everything in between. So I love the interaction. I love getting face to face. That's why I don't do just audio pod podcasts. I do a video because I want to be able to look. I want to see JD. I want to talk to him, see his reactions, like his facial expressions. Um, if he has stuff to show, I want to be able to see it. That's why I like the, the visual interaction. That's why I do video all the time. Uh, but I mean, basically, it, it, that's it. I want to be able to, to put out information, have a discussion about it in a casual manner. Like we've we've pretty much been having a ca uh, casual conversation this entire time, which that's what I like. I like to promote that. And seeing the questions that come in, there were a lot of questions tonight, which was good. I love that. It's people that are interested and curious about a topic that they probably wouldn't have access to normally or might be afraid to ask the questions uh, normally. And this gives them a forum uh, to to reach out and learn some more. So I love that. Um, uh, that's my reasoning behind it. I hope that answers your question, Bob. Um, oh, look, he actually says, I am not leaving yet, but I want to thank you both for tonight. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Bob, for joining us, for staying with us all night. I appreciate it. And with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, thank you, JD, for coming on. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate all your answers. I appreciate you fielding questions that might be, I, mean, I, I know it's hard to do Q and A, especially a live Q and A. Um, it, it's sometimes difficult because you're put on the spot with some questions and you're like, Oh, I didn't research this or I didn't do that. But I think you did great. Um, I think you answered questions to the, to, to satisfy. I was satisfied. So I'm happy. I don't care about anyone else. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I think everyone had a good time. I, I had a lot of positive feedback. I see a lot of positive feedback. So I think we had a good time. And uh, to wrap this up, I'm going to let you go. And then I'm going to do my, well, actually, I'm going to do my announcements. And then we're going to sign off. And then we'll talk a little bit after the show. So my announcements, basically, let's see. Uh First and foremost, I want to give a shout out to a friend of mine that passed away um, a little bit ago. His name was Kent Spotswood. He was a retired journalist. He was instrumental in my research on my article on The Conjuring House. I researched the histories, the inaccuracies of the history of The Conjuring House, um, all the deaths that were allegedly associated with the house. And Kent was instrumental in research. Uh, he gave me a lot of information. Awesome guy. Uh, we spent the day together. We actually found a lost cemetery. We uncovered graves that haven't been seen for years. Um, and it was great. He was a great guy. Unfortunately, he passed away about two weeks ago from a heart attack. And I just wanted to say um, to his family, my condolences and that I, I'm going to miss him. So with that, I'm going to move on to make sure you tune in every Friday night at 8 30 to 10 30 on WLFE. That's Wolf <laughs> WLFE DB Radio Network. And I am Kenny Biddle. I'll be broadcasting live, usually QA. Sometimes I'll have guests. And even when I do just QA, I can have guests on, which is great. I love doing that. Uh, Saturday nights, I do another podcast with, uh, Dave Schumacher and Tim Vickers called three tortured souls. Uh, there won't be one. Well, I won't be part of it. I don't know if it's still going on, 
Yeah, but I won't be part of it tomorrow night because unfortunately I have a, a funeral service to go to um, for somebody else. So whew, everyone's everyone's dying on me. So I'm trying to fix that. I don't need anyone else dying on me. Uh, let's see. Just about every weekend, I also release a video for K&D Adventures. That's uh, me and my wife have a YouTube channel. We go out, we explore new places, and we video it, and we take you along with us. So tune into that. If you look on YouTube, K&D Adventures, look for that, and you'll see a picture of me and my wife. So subscribe, because I need subscriptions. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, if you're tuning in live, or if you see this before tomorrow on Saturday at 2.30 p.m., Eastern time, I will be part of the Access Paranormal, uh, it, it's Paranormal Investigators Conference. I'll put a link in the description. I'm going to do a live broadcast lecture kind of thing where I do a, uh, a talk, a little bit about skepticism and the paranormal, and then a Q&A. And this is by Beth Darlington from Access Paranormal. She's over in the UK, originally from Australia. And she organized this. It looks to be good. There's a lot of other speakers who I'm sure I'm going to, you know, uh, conflict with <laughs> because some of them are paranormal investigators. But other than that, I think that's all I have to say. Let me check my notes. Yes. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So I'm going to wrap this up. We're a little bit early, but that's OK. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Thank you for the questions. And they were great. I mean, everyone was respectful. We had, we had good conversation. So I uh, enjoyed it. JD, thank you for being a guest and fielding these questions. And, um, again, nice t-shirt. I love that t-shirt. That's really cool. You know, the guy that designed that must be really, really cool. <laughs> he is. He is. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Very cool. So I'm going to, you hold on for a second. I'm going to end this broadcast. I'm going to play our outro and then we are going to end it and I'll see you next week, everyone.